Hi, I'm Cheryl. I'm Dan and welcome to our podcast. Where we're talking to real people about real problems in real situations. So grab a cuppa while we talk founder life. Welcome to today's episode of Founder Life where we are joined by the fabulous Alex from Zero. He's the UK and EMEA MD. And um, yeah, really pleased to have you on the show, Alex. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Danny. Uh, so, first of all, we thought it'd be really good to hear a little bit about yourself and what you do. So, for those who aren't familiar with Zero listening, what is Zero? And yeah, a little bit about your journey to where you are today. Sure. Um, well, that's a lot of questions. It could be a very long answer. So, let me try and break it down. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm Alex uh, von Schurmeister since. Just over a year ago, I'm the managing director for Zero here in the UK and also for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And for those that don't know Zero, um, I guess the shortest way to describe it is we are a cloud accounting software, um, and we sell that cloud accounting software either directly to small businesses, or in the majority of cases, we sell it to accounting and bookkeeping practices, who then activate it to their small business. Um, And really what we're trying to do with that software is obviously help small businesses be more successful um, and make sure that they get the best advice that they can from their advisors. And when I say cloud accounting software, Cheryl, you know this, right? It it isn't just really one software. There's a whole bunch of kind of adjacent functionalities that, right? There's the bookkeeping part of that. There's a tax part of that. There's some practice management software aspects to it. Um, there are potentially payroll aspects to that. And so different customers use different aspects of the kind of suite of products that we offer to them. But ultimately, the, the backbone of it is kind of bookkeeping and accounting software. Um, in terms of my background, I, I wasn't from this industry uh, before I joined Zero. I'm, I'm guessing I'm increasingly becoming part of the industry and I'm really enjoying that. But um, I'd be lying if I said I was in the accounting and bookkeeping software practice before. Um, prior to joining Zero, I've done a whole a whole host of different roles in a whole bunch of very different industries in a whole bunch of different countries. And I guess you know I, I think of that as having given me given me kind of a very broad background, and I use that breadth at Zero rather than having specialized. And so. I guess in quick succession, if I had to go all the way back, I started in consumer goods. And so did consumer good marketing for Procter & Gamble, um, which I always see as a very good schooling and understanding customers, right? Most consumer good companies are particularly religious about customer understanding. And and so it was a good school for that. I then tried my hand at consulting, management consulting. Um, Didn't particularly enjoy that. But mostly I didn't enjoy that because I I kind of missed that, I guess that tangible adrenaline of being in charge of something, right? It's telling other people what you think they should do is, look, I mean, there's a value to that. And and, and a lot of people really enjoy that. I didn't. I I just like doing things. But anyway, so I was a management consultant for a while. I then went into um, my first startup back in 99, 2000. Um, for anyone who remembers the 2000 bubble burst, that was a bad timing to go into startup, but <laughs> great, great lessons in life and a great learning experience. And funny enough, it was, a, it was a mobile commerce startup, arguably at least 15 years too early to be in mobile commerce. Um, again, hindsight's 2020. But because I had been in a mobile commerce startup, when that startup changed direction, I then went into telco because I was involved in the mobile world and, and kind of the telco world. So I went into telco uh, with Telefonica that allowed me to move to Spain and spend quite a bit of time in Spain and, and Latin America. And then 2004 was when I switched from telco and I went to eBay and eBay was really my first foray into a, a digital pure play company, right? And, and I guess eBay was particularly significant for several reasons. One, um, it was a digital pure play and and really introduced me into the world of digital transformation uh, very early on, right? This is 2004, so uh, 18, 16 years ago. Um, 
Second, it was a marketplace business, and, and that was still a very, very new model at the time, right? This kind of managing supply and demand um, and managing a marketplace business. And then most importantly, um, eBay really was my introduction into creating a platform that allows small businesses to, or small entrepreneurs to launch themselves on internet businesses, right? We started discovering a lot of buyers and sellers on eBay using eBay as a business platform. Um, so I did that for 11 years. eBay is also the one company where I then, I kind of, I call it graduated. I graduated from being a marketing person because I, I started as a marketing director and I was a CMO at some point. But I eventually graduated from being a marketing person to become the country manager and then kind of the general manager and then the MD. And I, I realized that as much as I love marketing and I love the fact that I have a marketing background, I actually enjoy being kind of a general manager, if you will. Um, and after 11 years at eBay and then switch, I, I came back to UK. I'd, I'd been all over Europe with, with eBay over several years. I came back to UK. And I did a digital transformation role in a British PLC called the RS Group. Um, it was called Electro Components at the time. They've changed their name since. But the RS Group is it's a distribution play in industrial and electronic components. And it's, it, it was, well, at least when I joined, it was very much a legacy company that used to sell via good old paper catalog, right? Most, most people in procurement offices would have the RS catalog. And... I helped RS on their journey to just digitalize and transform from being a paper catalog company to a digital company um, and did that through their technology and their platform and the digital teams and data, et cetera, and innovation. And after that, I, I just wanted to go back into a smaller, younger, more dynamic kind of tech pure play again. So I went into payments. I, I joined SumUp. Um, most people may have seen those small little white payment devices. Some of yeah. some of is one of the big brands mm -hmm. in that. And so I did that for um, almost two years across Europe. Um, before I, I kind of stumbled on zero or zero, zero stumbled on me, or at least we found each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so for the past year, I've been at, at zero. So again, I guess, I guess just summarizing briefly, um, very different industries, very different types of roles, um, many different countries. But I guess the common denominator, certainly since 2004 when I joined eBay, is a lot of them had to do something around either digital pure play or digital transformation. A lot of them had to do with digital tools for small businesses to be successful. That was certainly the case at eBay and also at SumUp, right? Because SumUp was very much around allowing small businesses to move from cash only to card acceptance and to use card acceptance to grow their businesses. And then obviously at zero. So there you go. Long, long story. I tried to summarize it as quickly as I could. It's a very, it's a very good story and a very interesting story. Um, the few things you said within that, that are quite interesting. So the, you said a couple of times about, um, um, being new to the industry with, with, with zero. It's not something you've done before. And I know you said that the link between it all is, is small businesses. Um, but, but what else was it that made you kind of want to move into the, that in, well, this industry with, with, with zero? Yeah, a, a few things, Daniel. Uh, the reality is, look, I'm again, hindsight's twenty twenty. I know a lot of things now I didn't know then, right? And I know now <laughs> that some of those career choices weren't always very obvious. And, and in hindsight, I probably made a few mistakes, right? I, I, I didn't love every single job and every single opportunity I had. I always, I always had a justifiable reason for taking the opportunity when I took it. And I learned a lot from every single one of them, but they weren't all great choices, right? And, and, and the reason I mentioned that is, and I think as I've gotten older and as I've picked jobs, I've become a lot more cautious about doing my homework and about the due diligence in terms of the opportunity I do take and and the company I do join. And so, look, number one on that list will be corporate culture and culture fits. And am I going to find a company with people that I will enjoy spending time with and enjoy working with and, and where I will both be allowed an opportunity to contribute and have an impact on the one hand, but be allowed an opportunity to learn 
and and kind of absorb and and kind of grow new muscle at the same time, right? And and so as I as I met Zero and I met more and more people at Zero and I was involved in the whole process, that box got ticked like big time, right? I really 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 enjoyed everyone I met um, and everyone I interviewed with during the process, and and obviously you've been. You've been working with Zero for quite some time. You know many of my colleagues, either you know, in in kind of uh, department consulting teams on the on the department marketing teams, and you know, and ho hopefully you'll agree with me. We have some some pretty cool people at Zero. So that box got ticked. I, I guess the second criteria for me was um, because ever since those eBay days, I have I have really fallen in love with, and this may sound like motherhood and apple pie, but I, I, I quite generally mean, I have fallen in love with this notion of helping small businesses. And there's something to be said around waking up on Monday morning and going to work and do something that, that matters and, and that you feel will have an impact and where you can get emotionally attached to what you're doing. And, you know, I mean, look, small business software, small business transformation. It's a pretty wide field, right? You could, you, again, you can tackle it from the payments volume. You can, but I, I really bought into Zero's commitment of having a purpose around helping small businesses succeed. And through my previous experiences with small businesses, I'd come across this notion, whenever you talk to small business around card acceptance, for example, or around, you know, hey, you should set up a business on eBay. Oftentimes, a small business owner will say, uh, I need to ask my accountant, right? Or I, I need to check that with my bookkeeper. And, and so I was always aware of the fact that there's this magical relationship um, of, of validation and of, of coaching that existed with advisors. And even though I'd never met the advisor, right? It was always like, well, I will ask my accountant and get back to you kind of thing. I knew that, I knew that there was something there. And so the, the opportunity to then join Zero and be part of helping small businesses through the accounting and bookkeeping product was, was something that that attracted me. Um, and then, look, third element, and, and but I'd be, I, th I think I'd be hypocritical if I didn't mention it. You wanna be part of a success story, you wanna be part of a growth story, right? And, and so it certainly felt when I looked at that industry, this industry and the space of accounting software and what's happening in this country, it certainly felt like Zero is a brand which has tremendous momentum, um, still a lot of growth potential, and and kind of fits into that growth story kind of category. And look, a year in, I'm not disappointed on either of those fronts, right? So the great people, I confirm, I'm, I'm still enjoying very much um, working with all my colleagues. The um, are we doing something to help small businesses? Yes, I think we are. Um, and, and it's very much part of what we do and, and what we believe in. And then is it growth story and is it a successful brand? And are there a lot of things to like? I think so. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, you know, that's, that's my story as to why I joined Zero and why I'm still here. It's a very good story. I, I like it. I like that. Yeah. Is, I think it's important, as you've mentioned quite a few times with that, to have that 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 drive and that passion for what you're doing and that small business uh, part that runs through it is, is very much that, that drive and passion. And um, the other interesting thing that you, you mentioned a lot there about having the passion for um, small businesses and, and you want to be part of that leading and pushing forwards. You said previously that you didn't like the kind of consulting aspect because you you didn't like telling people what to do all the time. Does that, what, what does that kind of tell us from what you've said about what drew you to zero and your passion versus that on your management style? How you want? Well, I, th I think, again, with, with the benefit of hindsight and age, uh, I know that what makes me tick is the opportunity to have an impact, right? I, I care about, I care about having tangible impact, not, arm's length impact, but tangible impact. And, you know, it's, it's funny, Daniel, and, and maybe I was very conditioned by the early stage of my career, right? When, when I was in consumer goods and, you know, say you're launching a new product out, you know, these aren't very exciting products, right? And I, I worked for the dishwashing category. So if you're launching your new bottle of Dawn renewed formula, right? Uh, as unexciting as it may be, but when you walk into an Asda or a 
Sainsbury's and you go to your dishwashing aisle and your new bottle, your new bottle, your little baby of your product that you launch is on that shelf, right? There's an unbelievable sense of tangible satisfaction you can touch and you say, I was involved in this project, right? I launched it. And, and I guess that has stayed with me in a sense that um, I really enjoy roles where I feel that I can have an impact on two dimensions. One is having an impact on the team um, and the people that I work with. Right? And, and I'd love to think that over time, you're part of their journey, right? And you're part of their professional experiences and you're part of their career path. And hopefully one day that they'll remember, oh yeah, I remember I had a manager at some point called Alex and you know he had an impact on me or not. And, and maybe they won't, but even, even, if, even if only a fraction of them feel that you contributed to their growth story, that impact is really important to me. And, and obviously I've had many managers and leaders having had that impact on me. And it's interesting when you, when you look at the way management consulting works, right? Management consulting firms typically assemble temporary teams on a project, finish the project, and then they move on to the next project. But the, the team for that next project is a new team. And so there isn't the same um, kind of length of relationship and that longer term ownership of that relationship in that particular industry as you would have, you know, certainly at, at zero. And so, so it's certainly one of the things that turned me off from consulting was this temporary nature of I'm diving into a problem, I'm providing a, a um, I'm providing not a solution, but I'm providing a recommendation of solution, and I'm actually not around to implement it or look at it being implemented, including the personal aspects of the team. So I care about the impact on the team. And then the second one, and I'm, I'm quite purposefully placing that second, uh, because I think if you have an impact on a team, the next one happens almost automatically, is impact on the business results, right? Impact on the business outcomes. If if you're managed to surround yourself with a great team and you give that team, you know, the proper empowerment and, and motivation and you delegate to them and you get out of the way, that team will hopefully do wonderful things. And then you will see the business results, right? You will see your sales grow. You will see... You know, um, in the case of zero, not only our revenues and our sales growth, because we're, you know, we are a publicly traded company at the end of the day. So we're, we're also trying to drive our results, but hopefully through what you do, you then see the results on the industry and on the small businesses you're trying to affect. Right. I like it. I really like it. So it's having that emphasis on, on that end goal, the, 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 the consumer and the people you're trying to impact and everything else will follow. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big believer as well. You look after the team, and the team will in turn look after the business. So that's kind of how I approach my leadership as well. So yeah. I totally resonate with that. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. And, and again, right, um, if we'd done this interview 10, 15, 20 years, I, I wouldn't have said it, and I probably wouldn't have known it. Um, I know now that the only reason I am where I am is because of the great teams that I've been surrounded with, right? And, and you're very much right on the shoulders of those great teams. And, um, you know, and obviously, I think one of the roles of a leader is to try and surround yourself with the best people, listen to them, play to their strengths, and then get out of their way, right? Because the reality is, ideally, you should surround yourself with people that are much, much, much better at what they do than you could possibly be. Um, but then what you want to make sure is you're almost like, you know, you're, you're an orchestra conductor to some extent, but then just let them do their magic. Right. And, and, and that's the beauty of every team I've led. And, and certainly the one at zero is um, I feel very fortunate to be surrounded by some of the smartest people I'm working with. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that was the bit I struggled with initially as I grew my team was stepping out of the way but not because I didn't trust them or I didn't support them or anything like that it was more a case of then I felt lost because I was like so what's my part in this now then <laughs> and that's kind of how I struggled with it I've got a lot better at it now and I know what my part in it is and but that was something that I, I had to learn so I'd never measured man oh, I kind of get my words out I'd never managed a team before I led a team so yeah, I think that's a really big important lesson to learn early on in your leadership journey isn't it stepping out of the way yeah, I agree. And, and that, 
I don't remember but when it happened for me. And I'm trying to remember what role it would have been. But I, I think there's that one magical step that happens at some point, right, where you need to learn to let go. And and you're still you're still a functional expert at what you had been doing most recently. So the temptation of wanting to do it yourself or the temptation of wanting to check everything or micromanage everything is huge. And you're probably still pretty good at it. And I think that notion of, well, wait a minute, I, even if I could have wanted to, I shouldn't, right? I should let go and I should trust it. And, and then learning to empower and to motivate, I think is really important. But but as you say, Cheryl, it's like, what, well, what's my role now, right? It's, I'm, I'm no longer diving in. Well, what is the role of not diving in and then kind of getting used to that uh, takes some time. Um, but I must say, I, you know, I, I think that happened now, so it's, it's fine. Do you think that's a massive, do you believe that that's quite a massive skill in in itself, though, knowing when you need to dive in and when actually you don't and you need to? Um, you... Certainly for me, Daniel, I mean, at the end of the day, right, it's, I, I understand there are very, very different management styles and leadership styles mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and they all have pros and cons. And, and, and by the way, many of them are very individual, right? I mean, many of them work well for a particular type of personality or person and, and, and not for another. Um, but for me, I think one of the crossroads was learning that, but right? learning when, when do you empower and kind of let go and step back. And then, you know, there are others, right? I think learning to manage remote teams um, is one I remember very specifically. With the, the first time you're managing not only, and, and this is all pre-COVID, right? So when I say remote teams, I, I think now we're all managing remote teams or have had to learn how to manage remote teams. But, you know, back in the day when there's a difference between your entire team is on site, on location, in the same office building, and you can kind of get them all in a room very quickly. And then the first time you're suddenly being asked to manage, you know, a remote team and either in a different region or a different city or in a different country, right? Or you, you, you end up, in my case, I think it was when I, when I had my first European role and suddenly I had teams that reported to me that were no longer in my same country. One, you know, this is pre-COVID and certainly pre-Zoom or uh, pre-Google Meets, what have you not, right? Just learning how to build the same level of relationship and trust that you would have built with someone in a physical location, while at the same time adapting ways of working and kind of operating mechanism that, that, you know, that was another kind of big, I guess, big managerial growing up and learning curve. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure there's others, but those are, those are two that I kind of remember as being pretty significant milestones. Hmm. Thank you to me. They definitely do. So you, you said, obviously you've been at zero now for just over a year. So what's been your highlight during that year? So many, Cheryl, so many. I think um, probably the biggest one is just because of the timing of when I joined, right, is I joined just as we were being kind of swallowed up by this whole Omicron brouhaha and the third or fourth or fifth lockdown, I don't even remember, right? But it also, so that was December when I joined, but it also meant that as of February, March, 2022, I then got to be part of this, we're coming back out and we're going back out and re-engaging with our customer base. And, you know, I remember the first few kind of luncheons we had with, you know, um, many of our partners across the country and I, I tried to travel and, and meet as many of them. It was, I guess it was a double whammy, right? It was, it was, it was just such a highlight because we were back out there again. And then second, in my particular case, because it was such an opportunity for me to just kind of, you know, drink from the fire hose and just take it all in and understand the industry. Um, and to this day, I still think physical engagement, um, whether it's at a lunch or at an event or, you know, at a context or obviously our, our own um, zero con, but those physical events, those zero awards, et cetera, I mean, the adrenaline and the buzz that I get out of that, I, I think all of those collectively would certainly be part of the highlight. Um, you know, listen, other highlights, um, I generally think that what's, uh, highlight. It, it sounds weird to say highlight, right? This country has been 
through so much churn in the last 12 months. Um, not just this country, the world has been through so much churn, but it, it feels like it's been accentuated in the UK, right? Between um, obviously coming out of COVID, the political upheaval, the, you know, X number of um, chancellors we've had with all the policies, and then you had, you know, supply chain issues and inflation issues and cost of living. And, and you know, none of that is a highlight, but I always find navigating complexity and coming out at the end of the year feeling like you managed to stay afloat, right? There's some satisfaction in that. And, and even though um, I think it was a complex year for all of us in the industry, um, I feel... I feel a certain sense of satisfaction for us to have come out of that at the end of the year, you know, with with our kind of head held high and our chin above water um, and looking forward into now 2023 with some sort of clarity as to what's coming ahead. Um, so, yeah, that may be, may be an odd one for me to pick as a highlight, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. I think we, uh, we did okay. Um, I think a lot of small businesses actually should give themselves a lot of credit for mm. getting through the last few years. It's, it's been a massive achievement. Yeah, so. I think you're right. I think you're right. And, you know, one thing, whenever I meet small businesses um, or startup founders or entrepreneurs, I mean, I couldn't do it, right? I, look, I'm, I'm a corporate guy, right? My first job was in a big corporate and every single one of my jobs has typically been in in corporations and even the ones I've had in startups, I was never the founder, right? I always joined a startup that someone else had founded and someone else had done the fundraising for. Um, when I think of the founders and the, the, the grit and the resilience and the energy and the appetite and the survival instinct, and I, I can only tip my hat off, right? Because it's absolutely, and, and you know, I mean, Cheryl, you're obviously a founder yourself, right, in terms of having your own practice. Uh, the amount of work and dedication and, and, you know, quite literally blood, sweats and tears that goes into that is <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, and even though I know I'm not wired like that and I don't think I could be, I guess being part of that ecosystem and contributing to that is, is, just gives me the highest satisfaction. Um, so you've talked a lot there about what motivates you and what you like to achieve out of business and, and everything. So what does success mean to you personally? What What is it that you're striving for, your driving force? Look, at, at a personal level, I, I think I'll come back to that word I used earlier, right, impact. Um, I think the... The biggest measure of success at the end of the day will be are you able to look back at your time somewhere someplace and are you able to point your finger at the impact you had right and, and then again i'll i'll talk about both dimensions the impact you had on people or teams or organizations you've touched and whether during your time with them you were able to you know bring them from point a to point b and then impact on the business in terms of where you're able to affect the business outcomes and, and you know, kind of um, provide the growth or provide the direction, provide the, the uh, kind of um, provide the, uh, I, I guess, kind of momentum into the business that, that you were asked to provide. Right. Um, and I guess, I guess very selfishly, it probably means, you know, are you, are you able to kind of personally be remembered for having had that impact, right? Is there, is there something that you can point to or someone else can point to say, oh, you know, yes, when Alex was here, right, we remember we were like this, and then after a year we were like this, and, and, and you just feel like you had something to do with that. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously in our home lives, you know, you, you try and have impact on your partner or on your family or your extended family, right? And, I think to some extent, we spend so many of our waking hours at work, you want to make sure that you're, you're having some sort of impact in your work environment as well. So that, that really is what it comes down to. Is, is, it, is it 
so you said about obviously about having impact on your working environment you also said about impact on on home life um it's a difficult balance isn't it quite often to try and find um how have you found that especially with some very large and difficult roles that you you you've 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 had over that time hard hard and i don't know daniel i suspect you know, history may judge me harshly, right? I've probably gotten it wrong more often than I've gotten it right. Um, you know, I I oftentimes, it, even though you're constantly attempting to balance it, right? Um, very often probably got that balance wrong and um, I, I couldn't have done any of it. And I couldn't do what I do now if it wasn't um, with just unbelievable kind of selfless support of my wife. We've been married for 21 years and, you know, especially I, we moved countries many times and every single time when I said, uh, honey, guess what? You know, we're having a conversation. They want to send me to Paris or to Zurich or to Madrid. You know, every single time she said, okay, I'll, I'll start packing. And, um, and she's, she's been not only part of that journey, I think, um, um, kind of on for the adventure, but she's also, you know, she's also kind of, made the best of it for her as well. And, and certainly, of, of, well, not oftentimes, every single time, I think she carried the brunt of some of the kind of logistical work. And, you know, I mean, moving households is hard enough in the best of times. Moving households across borders is even harder. And then moving households across borders with school-aged children, it's a whole different dimension, right? And, and so we've done that repeatedly, and, and I, I couldn't have done it without her, um, Daniel. But it also means I'm, I'm acutely aware of, I guess, some of the costs and sacrifices that that has meant for my family, right? Many of my roles, um, the one at zero, maybe a little bit less so, but many of my roles have uh, included just extensive travel, especially pre-COVID. Um, you know, there was a time when I'd, I'd probably be gone three, four nights a week, um, and again, that was, I guess it was part of my career journey. And it was, it was, some of that was done at a time where I think our discourse and our awareness and our conversations that we're having nowadays around work-life balance and mental health and diversity just, just didn't exist, right? I mean, well, I guess, I guess the, the discourse should have existed, but it was just, you know, it was squashed down. It just, there weren't things you would talk about. I think we talk about them much more openly now. And so it's much easier for me to now say, okay, well, you know, this is what it should have been like, but I wasn't always a very good pupil, to be honest. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Cause I think, I, I know you, you've obviously, you talked a lot there about, about the support on, on, on um, moving roles, moving countries, moving borders, um, which is interesting. But I do think a lot of um, small business and small business owners and founders kind of can relate to that, but on a slightly different level, because, you know, it sometimes you are sitting working on your computer at obscene hours at night. You are, you know, you do get that like that, maybe that moment at, at half one, two in the morning that you just need to write down um, you do get, you know, you do get that, uh, work at 6 a.m. and you've got this email and all of a sudden you just need to deal with it or a phone call, whatever. Um, so do you, so I think there's a lot that, that small business owners can relate that. But the interesting thing is, is, is what you said about support. Um, do you think without that, I mean, I know as a, as, as a, as running a small business, uh, and I know me and Cheryl have spoken about this many times without the support, I couldn't do it. Um, do, you, do you feel the same for you? Yeah, this, I, th I think um, it gets very lonely very quickly, right? And, and you're absolutely right, I think, and I see it with a lot of small business owners. And, and by the way, I mean, I started with my dad, right? My dad uh, still runs, he's, he's 83 years old, he still runs his own business. Um, and first of all, you're always on, right? I mean, you can't switch off. It's Saturday morning, you don't switch off. And on Sunday night, you don't switch off because anything could happen at any point in time, right? And, and I, I still remember he's, he's in the dairy industry and getting a call on Saturday morning saying, look, there's an electricity outage and the freezer is down and everything's about to, you know, start thawing and we're going to lose 
whatever, you know, how many thousands of pounds of inventory. Well, you know, that crisis can happen at any moment in time. Um, you know, the, the kind of having a family dinner and everybody's sitting down to watch TV, but you need to go through your accounts and, you know, go through inventory, whatever, because you need to put in purchase orders on the Monday morning. But I mean, it's always on, always on. You're absolutely right, Daniel. And I think when you're that, when you're that committed to something and you're always on, um, it, it can get very lonely. And, and so you, you need support and you probably need support from, from several sources because it's different types of support. Right? You can't always rely on your partner, for example, or on your parents or on your brothers and sisters to pro cause, cause they'll provide a certain types of support, but you know, you, you probably need a different type of conversation with say your best friend, which is different than one you would have with your wife, for example, right? And, and then you may have, I don't know, you may go to the gym and have a different type of conversation with your personal trainer or your mates at the gym than the ones you have with, but and, and obviously, especially for small businesses, I think the role you play in the accounting and bookkeeping space, right? And as advisors, it's just absolutely crucial. And I've, I've observed and I've seen, and, and you've told me stories right around some of the relationships you have with your customers, they're not the supplier customer relationship. You're almost like, you know, you're their they're psychologist, you're their psychiatrist, you're their personal coach, right? I mean, you, 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 you keep them sane. Um, and if they didn't have that, um, you just, and if they didn't have that and other sources of support, you just have to wonder, right? At, at what point does it just become too much? And, and we've done quite a bit of studies at, at zero, especially over the last few years with the whole pandemic around, almost that, that notion of mental health in small businesses, right? And we know many, many, many small businesses and business owners have been under an incredible strain just because they've had to manage the pandemic like everybody else, but on top of it, the consequences of the pandemic on their business, um, which again, just goes to my admiration for their resilience and, and how incredible, incredible that community of business owners is for having not only survived, but actually in many cases thrived over the last few years and, and done quite well. Thank you. No, I totally agree. Without the support of my husband and my friends in the industry and my coach, it's like I get different support from each of them. And then I go to my friends and get different support there. And it's, you do, you need not just that one person, it's the whole tribe, isn't it? It's your tribe, you need your yeah. Yeah, totally agree there. A quick shout out to our sponsor, Zero, who are the best accounting software out there for small businesses. Bank feed is something that we absolutely love, and it means that all the transactions from your bank get pulled through into Zero, meaning that we can then match them up to your bills and your invoices, making sure that you have clear and up-to-date records. There's no security risk because it literally is just pulling the bank transactions down so you have no access from zero into your bank account. Check it out today on zero.com. And I've got to ask, obviously you've been to so many different countries and lived in so many different countries, which has been your favourite country? Because I love holidays. <laughs> so, which world has been your favourite to either visit or live in? That's probably the hardest questions I get asked, um, Cheryl. And Putting you a little bit on the spot, isn't it? Because yeah. <laughs> it's fine, but, but I'll tell you why I find it so hard to answer. I mean, the reality is, I think every every country has offers something so different and has very different value propositions, right? And I think, and if you appreciate every country and every culture for that differentiation, the distinctive value they bring, then then you know you get to enjoy all of them. I guess. I guess the first mistake is when you're actually trying to measure them all according to the same measuring stick, right? Because then, and you know, reality is also, I, I lived in them at different stages of my life, right? I, my wife and I moved to Madrid, uh, recently married before we had children. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure I would know what Madrid is like as a parent of teenagers, for example, right? I was, I was a parent of teenagers while I lived in Zurich and Zurich's a very, comparatively speaking, much smaller and a very, very safe city in a very safe environment, very clean. And so, you know, certainly as a parent of teenagers, I really, really appreciated Zurich. Uh, but, you know, Madrid has a, a buzz and obviously that Latin culture buzz to it, which is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, you know, 
Paris, Paris is, it's a, it's a great city. I, I happen to be Francophile. My wife's French. Um, so I speak the language. I, I love the culture. Um, and I just think Paris is great, but it also, it also kind of, it's a very intense city, right? So, so I, I find big cities like Paris or London are intense cities, but they're also cities that, um, you know, they, they provide so much, but every now and then you just need to get out. You need a break. Right. Um, and you know, London, London's interesting. I've now been, this is the second time I'm living in London and I've now been living in London since 2015. Um, I, I don't think there's another city like it, right? London, it, London almost is a country in its own right, just because it's so different from the rest of this country, right? Uh, London mm -hmm. and, and middle England, for example, are, are two completely different, different, um, uh, yeah. environments mm -hmm. and London. And I don't think there's any other city in Europe that comes close, right? Even other international cities like Berlin, uh, pale in comparison to just the diversity of, of the London community. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm giving you a long winded escape to say, I, I can't really pick a favorite one. I think they're, uh, they're all, they're all very different for different reasons. Uh, from a visiting perspective, I think we talked about it earlier, right? I'm, I'm a bit of a wine nerd. So I, I tend to like wine countries. Italy, France, Spain are, are kind of uh, perennial favorites. I, I also am a bit of a foodie. So the whole wine food pairing in those countries um, always, always works. I was born and raised in Mexico. So Mexico is always a country I, I love. I, I still, it's no longer home, but I guess it's still my emotional home country, right? So when I go back to Mexico, it's always a bit of a homecoming or a bit of a nostalgia trip. And I don't think I'd ever move back there, but whenever I do go back to Mexico, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm filling my nostalgia tanks with, uh, with a bit of Mexico. And then, you know, once I, once I fill them up, I leave again. So, uh, yeah, different countries, different purposes. That's, that's interesting. Is there anywhere that you haven't been to yet that is on your list to go to or? so many so many places and all yes a lot of them and also there are many countries i've been to say on business travel and it doesn't count right i've, I've been to istanbul several times airport office business meetings hotel one or two nights couple of business dinners airport back out do i feel like i actually know istanbul or turkey i don't right and um same thing goes for, I mean, I, I recently visited our headquarters in kind of New Zealand, Australia. I had a couple of business meetings and, you know, and, and, and a meal here or there, but do I feel like I know New Zealand, Australia? I don't. So I'd, I'd love to spend more time in, the, in there. I think, I think if I had to generalize as an area, the few times I have been to Southeast Asia, um, I think, I think that region is fascinating. I'd love to spend more time there if, if, if I had, if I had time. Um, I certainly think both China and India are fascinating countries I haven't spent enough time in, and I'd love to explore more of them. But then, you know, the reality is Europe has so much to offer. I mean, even, even if you go to countries like Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary, and pff, there's, there's so much to see just on our doorstep and kind of a two hour flight away, you don't always have to do kind of a 12, 14 hour flight, right? So, uh, you know, when they say the world is your oyster. I, I really think that's the case and you couldn't, you couldn't ever be finished. And as, as I said, my wife's French and we spent quite a bit of time in France, but even, even France, I mean, I, I know, I know 1% of what, what France has to offer, right? There's just so many places. There is, isn't there? Our, our bucket list seems to grow by the day, <laughs> but um, yeah, New Zealand and Australia is probably top. Yeah. And I'd love to spend six months or so over there. I've got family in New Zealand. I'd love to go and see them and then spend some time and tighten the zero con. Maybe go to buy. Sounds like a project, Cheryl. Sounds like <laughs> there, let me know and we'll make sure you can go and visit and uh, and have our uh, our teams there kind of uh, give you a bit of a show around. Yeah, that, well, I was pretty gutted. Um, July 2020, I was due to go to New York. Okay. And um, for my fourth year, yeah. and um, I've just aged myself there. I'm like, <laughs> but no, I was. Um, I've been here. What? Yeah, I was trying to go to New York. I can cut that bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
um, yeah, but no, I was like, oh, I'm going to go to New York. And then I, as soon as we booked the trip, the next thing I was doing was looking up where the zero office was. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying to my husband, do you mind if we spend like a couple of hours and go and say mm-hmm. hello to everyone? <laughs> I'm sure that went down as a charm. And to be fair, it was quite interesting. So he was, he was up for it. But, um, well, we all know what happened in 2020 and I never got there, so... Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. What happened in 2020? <laughs> oh, I don't know. But no, so it's now the bucket list for my 50th. There you go. Excellent. So, uh, we should do that then. But no, so you, obviously you mentioned you spoke, you speak French. Is there any other languages that you speak? Well, I grew up speaking Spanish and German because my parents are both German. Oh, wow. And uh, our our home life... And our household was always very German, and, and you know we celebrated German Easter and German Christmas, and a lot of the home traditions and whatever we cooked at home. And I went to German private school in Mexico. But then my social environment, my friends, and you know everything, um, and even at the school, um, most of my friends were Mexican. So I, I grew up speaking Spanish and German. Um, then picked up English along the way um, in school. And then learned French later in life, and so no, I, I stopped there. Um, I'd say that's pretty good. <laughs> say to stop there. Yeah, but it's it, it, different languages. It's a lock of circumstances, right, Daniel? I don't, I don't, I've never, I, I've never felt I, I deserve any particular credit for it, right? I mean, I, I just happened to grow up with two, and then you learn the third one in school, and um, and. You know, I, I, I guess I've, I've, I've used them. I've used them well in my career. And Europe's particularly useful as an environment to then make use of them, right? Just because you can, you can kind of get on a train or on a plane and half an hour later be in a different country and speak another language. Um, but I was just, I was, I was very fortunate and very privileged in my upbringing to be given those languages on the road. Right? It's really, it's really helpful. And do your children all speak multi languages? Yeah, my daughter more so than my son. Um, I think she's more linguistically wired. Um, and she kind of grew up during that stage when we were doing a lot of these country moves. And so as much as she didn't necessarily appreciate every single one of them, uh, especially the later ones when she was kind of a teenager. But I think in hindsight, she would now say that she understands how much she benefited from learning and adapting to new cultures, new languages. Um my son's younger, and so by the time we came to the UK in 16, he was seven years old. And so now for the past seven years, he's been here. And so he, he actually, even though he, he doesn't have an English passport, but he considers himself English, right? He has, a, he has more affinity to the English language and to this country than to anything else. Um, and if anything, his, his French is starting to become a bit rusty, which is... a of concern to his mom, and he hasn't really wanted to pick up anything else. So he's uh, he's less linguistically inclined, which is okay. So I guess England's probably the thing that, or the place that he knows the most. Then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah um, he was. We had, we had uh, it was fun during the World Cup, right? Because we well, we couldn't get four family <laughs> members to agree on who we were rooting for, right? Everybody was rooting for the country, so he was, you know, he was England all the way. So he was very upset when uh, England lost. <laughs> You, you said about your daughter. You felt uh, she realizes she's she's benefited from yeah. um, learning the language and adaptation. I think I think that's a massive thing, isn't it? In terms of being able to adapt different situations and get the best out of it. Um, I think it's massive lessons, isn't it, for any anything in life, like whether you're running a business or or just just in in general lifestyle situations. Look at again a lot of it. And a lot of it happened through circumstance or I was lucky enough, you know, either through job changes or study changes to experience a relatively kind of international career. Um, and it wasn't, all, you know, I, it's not like I grew up and I had this master plan, right? I'd be lying if I said that. And I'm not sure I always fully understood the benefit, but I do now. And... You know, in, in my daughter's case, I, I just see it, right? I think the way she's grown up, and yes, sometimes it meant being uprooted and being thrown into a new environment where she had to, you know, she had to kind of struggle in, in, in readjusting. 
but I do think it has given her a certain kind of openness to other cultures and other styles and other types, and uh, which I hope will be beneficial for her longer longer term, right? And I often, even even at work, um, Daniel, you know, whenever younger colleagues come to me and, and talk about, you know, what should I do? And I always encourage people to go out and try and get an international experience, right? Now, whether that's when you're studying and you, you're able to kind of do your third year abroad and do an exchange, or whether that's, you know, even at a younger age, right, doing a summer camp, if you can afford that, um, in another country, um, or, you know, if you work for a company that does allow you to some extent, say, you know, a, a global posting, I, I mean, I don't think there's any harm to begin with, right? You can always come home if you want to, right? And normally, your country will always take you back, right? As long, as long as you don't lose your passport. And so I guess my message to, to younger colleagues is always just, just go, right? Go learn, see another country, see another culture. And if you don't like it, come back. If you do like it, then you take it from there. Um, and it's, and what I say younger colleagues, just because it's easier to do the younger you are, right? And before you start owning a house or, uh, you know, school age children, et cetera, right? I mean, just, you have a certain flexibility uh, when you're in your late teens or in your twenties or early thirties that, that starts kind of waning as you get a bit older, so. You said, we, when we got back from our summer holiday, um, my my daughter, she's she's eight, um, but she's adamant she wants to wants to move to where we were. She keeps saying, oh, <laughs> can we go and live there? <laughs> not sure we can <laughs> but... I think I'm the other way around I think but then I think I missed out on it when I was younger and now we've got kids and we're a blended family we have a lot of restrictions so that's out of the cars now so we're in a way counting down to when we don't have the restrictions and we can go and travel and move to another country and so yeah we're going to end up doing that later in life but I think it's because I missed out and didn't do it earlier in life. I now like, oh, yeah, there's something I really, really want to do. So yeah. it's never too late. <laughs> no, it's not. It's never too late. And I think that's the beauty of working and having my own business mm. and working digitally as well, because it does mean that I just need to pack my laptop off and off we go. And I'll fit in with whatever time difference and time zone it is and go. Right. <laughs> It's uh, it'd be amazing. Um, you mentioned again that your wine, mm. wine buff, <laughs> as um, you've got an accreditation, haven't you, in in wine? Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's uh, I've liked wine for many years, but uh, it's I'm trying to think what the trigger was um, for me to then starting wanting to kind of study it a bit more seriously. So I, I, I've done a few wine certifications kind of in the evenings or on weekends or in between jobs, right? And, and a lot of them nowadays, you can get them quite easily online or, um, you know, certainly in the UK, there, there are a whole bunch of wine schools and oftentimes local wine schools. And so I've, I kind of went to the WSET, which is the Wine Spirits Education Trust, and I've gotten a few of their certificates. Um, I stopped short of the next step because then you can you can get more advanced, but that's typically if you work in the wine trade, which is in my case. Uh, and then there's another certification called the Wine Scholar Guild. So I've gotten a few of theirs and I've signed up for another one this year. Um, and it's it's just a hobby, Cheryl, right? I mean, I like, I like drinking wine, but uh, there's, you know, I, actually it's funny. I, I hadn't really realized it when I started, but, but I guess I do now. And maybe it's me just trying to justify myself, but um, there's an interesting parallel to some extent with small businesses, right? Because a lot of these wine growers, forget the big wines, but a lot of the wine growers are farmers, right? And and they're small business owners. And it's a breakneck industry. I mean, making a profit in, in wine, if you're not one of the big chateaus, is, is hard. It's super, super hard. And, and obviously, you know, you depend on the weather and the climate and the seasons and whether it was a frost or hail and what have you not and the yield and then all the regulations, right? Because there are a lot of regulations for how you make the wine and um, and the, the kind of the supply chain. And so there's, 
there are a lot of parallels between being kind of a vintner or, or kind of winemaker and being a small business and just how incredibly hard it is. But it means when, when that bottle is then finally out right, and bottled and labeled, what went into that is, again, it's sweat, blood and tears. And, you know, and then obviously whether you like it or not, it's, that's a very, very subjective matter. But uh, I've enjoyed learning more around just the complexity of it, right? You have between the soil time and the latitude and the grape variety and, you know, how much of the wine is influenced by how the grape grew and how much of the wine is influenced by how the winemaker made the wine, right? And, and so how much of that is, is kind of in nature versus the actual making. Um, and I think the jury's out on, on how much, you know, it, it, again, very subjective, but um, it just makes me appreciate how much work goes into a bottle. Um, so yeah, it, it, that's that's kind of how, how that passion evolved. Unfortunately, my wife would say I probably spent too much time and money on it, but, um, it's look, it's it's a hobby. <laughs> you you said when about traveling, you said about um, Italian, uh, French, and um, and and Spanish wines. Are they particularly your your favorite kind of regions, or is it? Yeah, but almost almost just by the fact that I've again I, I've lived in Spain and France and speak their languages, right? So I think I think just I'm naturally I've been closer to them, and I've had an opportunity to travel into wine country mm -hmm. in those in those countries and visited regions and tastings and um and so i'm more familiar with them and, and that probably plays a big role um but look, i've had excellent wines from other parts of the world it's just i, I don't know them as well right if if you ask am i an expert on the wines of chile i'm not um and but i've had some excellent chilean wines so i guess i guess i've, I've developed kind of my weaknesses on some wines so, but Part of, part, and that's, I guess, the other reason why I'm studying it is through the study, it almost forces you to open up your, again, your um, perspectives. And, and, you know, as part of the, because you're studying different grape varieties in different regions, you're being forced to taste new regions or new grapes, and you're being forced to at least appreciate what went into, whether you then like it or not, that's a different story. But you're being forced to appreciate just the diversity of winemaking that exists out there. And so, you know, I don't know, I, I'm, a year ago, if you'd asked me if I'd ever had or appreciate any Greek wines, the answer would have been no. I now have to study some of them and taste some of them. And uh, oh, lo and behold, there's some very, very, very nice and decent Greek wines, right? And so, the, so there you go. It's kind of, it, it's just a constant learning journey. It is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, it is. I'm not. So I... Not really a wine person, although I am really getting into Proseccos and different champagnes and things. That's how it starts, with. Cheryl. That's how it starts. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, we bought, when we did our kitchen, we ended up with a, a wine rack. Yeah. It was like, oh, we're never going to fill that. But yeah, we have now. <laughs> so, I still, I don't matter how hard I try, I still can't drink red wine though. Oh, really? But you know, it's interesting, my aunt. Uh... My late father-in-law, he, he always used to say, uh, it was one of my favorite quotes he had, and I'm sure it wasn't his, but he used it. He used to say all the time, he said, you should always have a bottle of champagne in your fridge because sometimes you have an occasion to celebrate and you'll be happy that you have a bottle of champagne in your fridge. And sometimes you open your fridge and you stumble upon the fact that you happen to have a bottle of champagne in there and that becomes a reason to celebrate, right? And so, <laughs> basically, uh, man, you're, you're having champagne all the time, right? But, uh, but yeah, there's some... I like it. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it justified constant champagne consumption. <laughs> <laughs> looking, well, it's looking at something for a positive, isn't Absolutely. it? Rather than, negative, rather than a negative, positive outlook. It is. And I think it's. Oh, I've completely lost my train of thought there. Never mind. <laughs> Dinker, so it'll come back. <laughs> no, I completely lost it. Um, so, I just wanted to ask you actually before I forget. We obviously we was the last time I saw you, Ursa, was at the House Commons when we. Yep. What was it, we we was there to support zeros. Um, report on getting paid. Yeah. Have you seen much impact since then? Or has there been any um, updates to? We have. Um, I, I guess the ultimate impact in terms of 
have we say have we seen payment terms get better? No, we haven't, right? Um, and I think the well, sad, that's not going to happen overnight. Well, exactly. Uh, the, the sad reality, Cheryl, is that uh, you know I think the the fundamental behavior of larger companies towards smaller companies uh, isn't going to just magically change overnight unless there's either some sort of legislation to help push that, or you know unless I guess it was a sudden conscientious awakening of kind of larger corporates or small enterprise, but I'm, I'm not holding my breath, to be honest. Um, so I guess when you then look at, well, if that's not going to happen immediately, at the very least, is the, is the dialogue around late payments and is the sense of urgency around late payments uh, getting, getting better? And, and there the answer is yes, absolutely, right? I think uh, just after our event at the House of Commons, we saw Labour publishing kind of um, a manifesto around some of their financial policies, and that very specifically included um, some notions around how to tackle late payments. And the current government has now officially announced that they're launching a study on late payments, and and we'll look at that matter more seriously, right? So. Again, proof will be in the pudding in terms of how long that takes and what the ultimate recommendations are. But I was encouraged. I was encouraged to see that the topic is being taken seriously both by the sitting government as well as by labor and is now being looked at. And I definitely, I, I've been in contact with my MP since um, a couple of times and she said she was raising it as well. Yeah. So. I'd like to think they start taking it seriously and actually help small businesses. I mean, it's not like we're looking for handouts and things like that. We're actually looking for change and help with the legislation to help small businesses, isn't it? So. Well, what's interesting, I guess, two ahas for me at the event at the House of Commons. One is many MPs have small business backgrounds or, you know, they themselves were or are small business owners. So I think they... Um, they relate to the struggles of being a small business and they relate to, to late payments being one of the most critical ones or cash flow being one of the most critical ones. Um, the second one to me was around, um, you know, I've lost my train of thought. Um, one was one, one was the small businesses in amongst the MPs. Um, oh yeah, sorry. The second one is when you think of all of the different measures that the government may be contemplating to help small businesses. And you just mentioned, right, we're not asking for a handout. This one wouldn't cost anything. We're not asking for a budget to be committed to it. It's mostly, can you just help shine the light on the topic? Can you help mandate um, just the way you mandate certain ESG behaviors in FTSE companies or the same way you mandate um, you know, diversity hiring in large corporates, well, can you mandate better payment discipline, right? And it doesn't come at any cost. You don't need to commit billions of pounds of a budget to it. So it, it's, it just strikes us as such a low-hanging fruit, a quick win in terms of here's something easy you could do without any budgetary implications, which will fundamentally help small businesses. Exactly. And actually, in turn, it will help the government. <laughs> Well, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because if small businesses get paid, they can pay their taxes. If small businesses don't get paid, they can't pay their taxes. Right. So the government are losing. <laughs> so you'd think it'd be in their interest to to help <laughs> and yeah. to mandate the payments. I mean, they're quick enough to send bailiffs around and things like that if they don't get paid. So why can't they <laughs> help us get paid? Because <laughs> exactly as you say, because it not just kind of getting tax bills paid on time, but I mean, there's scenarios that I've, I've heard from, from, from business friends, I suppose, that are business owners, um, where companies are just paying part of the invoice and going, I'll send the rest a bit later. It could be months and months, but if they got that invoice quicker, they had something else that they could put it into to help the business grow, which then would be an even bigger tax take for the government, for the government. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, 
it's a win-win. It is a win-win for everybody. It is a win-win. Absolutely right. And and again, I guess ultimately, the healthier our small business ecosystem is, the healthier kind of the almost the fundamental tissue of our society is. Right. So, and and we all know that as individuals, right? Even if even if you work for one of these large companies, right, you're, you're still an individual citizen and you would like in your community, your small businesses to be thriving. So um, I, I think I think this, this collective awareness and conscience of we need to make sure that our small businesses and our communities continue thriving is really important, but that needs to kind of you know, it's work, work its ranks through in terms of, well, what does it mean for larger corporate behavior when it comes to prompt payments? And, and you know this, right? Because you work with your businesses, you, you you know all the different shenanigans that get used in order to either delay payment or avoid payment. Or um, and and the sheer reality is, small businesses just oftentimes do not have the negotiation leverage to do anything about it. And if anything, they're just they're intimidated into accepting whatever payment terms get offered to them in order to get the business because they're so desperately trying to you know, grow their business and, and um, they end up they end up just being punished for that, right? Punished for their generosity and punished for their willingness to serve and, and their willingness to create a thriving business. Um, and they just lose out on their cash flow. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think the thing, obviously with bigger corporations and things, it, there's a lot of processes, there's a lot of red tape and everything, but when it's small businesses paying other small businesses, I think that winds me up even more because you know what they're going through and i always liken it when i'm talking to somebody is you wouldn't go into tesco's go and pick up your weekly shop get to the till and say oh i'll pay you next week <laughs> you would pay. Yeah. and i think yeah why don't we have that same mindset when it comes to working with one another i mean i do i'd always pay all my suppliers I, that that's probably one of the things that scares me the most is not being able to pay suppliers yeah. my team and I will do anything to make sure that they get paid before I do. Sure. And then obviously the government last. <laughs> but it's it's one of those things though, isn't it? It's that toss up. And yeah, I just don't understand people's mentality sometimes. Yeah. Come on that for hours. <laughs> I think we all could. I think that's why there was yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. And one I can't make many predictions for 2023, but the fact that we will continue being vocal on this topic is certainly one I'm willing to put my hand in the fire for. Oh, definitely. I think this is something that's going to go on for a while. Yeah. And the more we bang on and bang the drum, the better, really. Yeah, I agree. But there are so many different things that business owners can do to help the process. So it's just making sure that everyone is as efficient as possible. And then I agree. we'll carry on with the rest. I, mean, mm. I think if we, this is, uh, this is probably going a bit too far backwards to it all, but I do think there's kind of a, if we, if we just take back to what late pay, late payments and things that essentially are payments are numbers. And I just think going all the way back to school where kind of Rishi Sunak is now saying, school children need to do maths till what, 18. Well, what about teaching fundamental financial literacy? Um, interest rates, savings rates, um, same for retirement, um, you know, budgeting, cash flow, all these sort of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would be so much more of a life skill. Yeah. And over a term of generations probably would eradicate some of these things because people would have the financial literacy and understanding to understand what these things mean. Yeah. Um, Amen to that, Daniel. I'm I'm a big believer. I don't I don't disagree with the fact that math should be taught in schools, right? But it's I liked math. So uh, I'm wrong, but. <laughs> but I agree there there are so many other fundamental skills that are not being taught um, in schools around you know, financial literacy, as you were mentioning, but also how to deal with conflict, right? Or how, how to kind of develop the resilience to, to deal with, um, uh, you know, with, with harder situations or how to negotiate. Uh, I mean, don't get me started on, you know, nutrition, for example, and many, many, many other topics, right? But I was, and I, I made that, I made that point, I think at one or two conferences last year, um, 
it's not even just school, but even the university, right? So my, my daughter is studying business and she was completely put off by her accounting 101 course in year one, it completely put off because the very first day of accounting 101 at university was here's the 160 page or whatever many pages annual report of St. Spirit. Please go to page 67 and figure out some free cash flow calculation, right? And <laughs> so as you can imagine, she didn't particularly enjoy that. And what's, what I struggle with is when I have conversations with, you know, certain conversations we've had, Cheryl, or, you know, some of your colleagues in the industry, and you tell me the stories of how you help small businesses. Right, well, that's the magic of accountancy and bookkeeping, right? And yes, at the end of the day, in order for that magic to happen, of helping a small business thrive, you then reverse engineer. And yes, at some point you obviously need to run numbers and yes, you need to run a free cash flow, free cash flow statement or look at a balance sheet or, you know, income statements. But it's like, why don't we start with that, right? Why don't we start some of our teaching of financial fundamentals or teaching on accountancy? with the impact of it. So we get people interested in, oh, wait a minute, if I can do that, how do I do that? And then you go back to the math, right? So uh, spoiler alert, my daughter is not going to become an accountant. She has, you know, other than the mandatory classes she had to take, all of her electives are in, in marketing or in communications or in other topics because it, it completely put her off. And it's a shame. It is, it is a shame. Um, but I think, you highlighted to me there massively is understanding why you need to do things and what the impact is of doing that and that's something that we are really trying to impact with our clients at the moment it is not just say right well we need this or we need that we try and explain to them well why what's the benefit to them but it, yeah it goes back to it a lot of it i know like the kids they come home from school do you have a good day no <laughs> why not oh it was rubbish it was boring and look, because they don't see the bigger picture and they're too young, some of them, to see the bigger picture. But if, I think it goes with everything. If you can understand why, then you're more going to get the how. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Definitely. It's, it's the same way it works, right? I mean, and any, any kind of strategy or any operational plan we do in the company, if I try and communicate that out to our zero colleagues, well, you don't just go and say, well, let's do this and this and this, right? You explain what you're trying to achieve and, and, and why you're trying to achieve it. And then you go into the, well, the way we're going to do it is this, 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 and that. It just, yeah. Where I, I think our education mechanisms have a bit of catching up to do in terms of providing that why before getting to the how. Yeah. I think if everyone can understand and explain the, the mission and the journey that you're on, then you all know you're in the same boat, don't you? Heading in the same direction. So, yeah, um, yeah it doesn't happen very often. Well, it's, <laughs> I think it's concerning when you when you think about you know some of the um, obviously we we all struggling with recruitment and shortages and you know of, of skilled labor and you know I certainly speaking to many of you and and you know both bookkeeping and accounting right you're struggling finding people and I think part of the challenge is there are fewer people graduating in those fields nowadays. Um, so it, it really comes down to how do you make sure that you still make those fields of study attractive to enough young people to, to get them to apply to the schools and get their certifications and what have you know? It's the, it's the same in, 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 in what I do. It's there, there's a massive under, under, uh, there's there's a massive there's a massive need there and just not enough not enough advisors to service it um, and that's just going to get worse as time goes on just because there isn't isn't the people coming through um, just don't want don't want to be financial advisors for some reason or another. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, I think we're going to finish up shortly. But I just wanted to look ahead. A little bit before yeah. we finish up so just wondered what was next from zero so obviously we've seen a load of stuff going on and 
Um, you've got a new CEO coming in in February to replace Steve Ramos. Yeah. What can we expect from Zero over the next, say, 12 months or so? I'd start with hopefully the most obvious, Cheryl, which is, um, you know, I don't think the arrival of a new CEO means there is a shift or change in the direction or a kind of in a strategic direction of zero and certainly not in our purpose and why we do what we do, right? That's when you think about Steve was only our second CEO after the founder, Rod Drury. Um, and, you know, I guess if, if you had to draw a caricature, kind of you have the founder CEO and then you have the, the first CEO that starts kind of, I guess, formalizing the scalability of the company. And, you know, now that Steve's retiring, Sukinder's coming in as, as our third CEO uh, for the next chapter, right? And uh, I look I look forward to her arrival. I think she's, um, you know, again, she doesn't come from the industry, so she'll bring in uh, new and fresh perspectives, but she does come from the technology space and understands technology companies and, and kind of SaaS companies very well. Um, so I certainly look forward to that, but I don't expect any any massive shifts in direction. What what she will surely do, as any new incoming CEO does, is you know probably look at capital and resource allocation and and just make sure that the way we're prioritizing certain projects globally and and resource allocation globally is as focused and as sharp as it needs to be for us to perform well this fiscal year and then coming fiscal years. But, but you would expect any incoming CO to, to kind of just do a review of that. Um, within that, right, and, and I think within the world of zero, it's pretty clear that um, the path we're on and the opportunity in the UK is pretty, pretty tremendous. And so the attention and the focus and the investment that goes into UK, um, I feel very, very confident will remain. And, and we will obviously kind of keep um, globally, I guess, over allocating in terms of paying attention to this market. What's what's next from zero? Look, and as always, you know, I, I think we know that many of our core products are um, good, but can be great and even greater. And so there's continuous investment in making them even better, right? Whether it's our kind of a core bookkeeping product, uh, but even some of the features in it, right? Whether it's the reporting features or whether it's the reconciliation features. And we have we have product teams globally working on all of them to just continue to make them better, to help you then offer better services to, to your small businesses. Um, when you look at some of the adjacent products um, in this country in particular, I think we, we have been for the last few years and we will continue being for the next few years, on a journey to continue improving our tax products and our tax offering. Um, some of that driven by HMRC regulations and we, we can get back to making tax digital in a second, but even outside of it, making tax digital, right? We, we realize that our tax product is a pretty fundamental part of our offering. And so we will continue investing in that and, and make it better. Um, and then also our, our practice management product, right? XPM is one that we want to continue paying attention to. We, we realize that for certain practices of a certain size, a product such as XPM is pretty critical. And that, you know, um, what we offer today is, is again, good, but not great yet. And so we want to continue investing in it. So uh, it, it may sound boring, um, but I hope it isn't. We will continue improving, in particular, our bookkeeping, our tax and our practice management products. Um, and it doesn't mean we, we won't do the other things, but, but certainly a big, big focus is on that. Um, Look, I think as an industry, I mean, we're, it's not even been a month, right, since we all learned, uh, at least officially learned, that HMRC has now decided to not only delay MTD for income tax self-assessment, but also change some of the kind of the thresholds and, and the way kind of the slicing and dicing. And I think as an industry, we're all still trying to assess and adjust some of our plans and our operating plans in terms of what that means. Look, at, at zero, at, I don't think it changes the journey and the trajectory we're on of the fact that we are digitalizing our tax systems and that over the next few years, right, making tax digital is going to happen. Um, and I don't think it changes the fact that the sooner businesses get on that program, the better off they are, just because we know that digitalization and being on top of your numbers is beneficial to you. So I, I don't think it should detract from our plans and from our push to kind of 
basically continuing on to making tax digital its uh, path, even if the actual mandation date per se has now shifted. Um, but what I suspect we all will be doing is uh, kind of reassess or reprioritize some of the plans kind of in, in their detail and their minutia, right? But I don't expect us to just stop talking about it overnight just because HMRC has changed it. Um, and, and just like I suspect you won't just stop talking about it with, with your clients. Um, so, well, guys, I think the one thing I look forward to in 2023, especially on behalf of small businesses, hopefully is a bit more stability. This year has been unbelievably unstable, right? It's, it's for many, many months, especially as there were kind of government shifts. Uh, the, the challenge is they, they, just, they just didn't know which way it was going to go. And, you know, that, and again, I'm preaching to the choir. You know this, right? I think if, if you tell a small business, look, be ready for 10% inflation, well, there's ways you can be ready for that. But you need to know that that's going to be the case, right? Or be ready for these and these and these tax regulations that they can be ready for that if they have advance notice and if it's not a moving goalpost the challenge is when every month or two months or you know you have a new announcement new announcement and you have you know you change the tax code and then you rechange and you backtrack and at, at some point um i think small businesses really struggled this year just just knowing what's what um i'd like to think that that environment is going to be more stable in the next 12 months, which would allow small business to have better visibility as to what's coming, what they need to be ready for and prepare for. Um, and, you know, within that environment, I, I think we want to do more of the same, right? Continue engaging with our community of, of partners um, and practices um, and do more of that. We want to, as I said, work on our products and continue improving our products. Um, and, you know, hopefully, by doing that kind of serve our purpose, which is helping small businesses be successful. Mm, that sounds, I guess the MTD announcement must have thrown your plans off. It certainly threw our plans off, but we're, we're like you, we're pressing on anyway, because we haven't had a sole trader offering for a, a good few years, because basically it wasn't a profitable service for us. Um, our, processes limited with geared more to the limited companies but with the opportunity of mtd we saw an opportunity for us to relook at that so we've been putting together an offering and um yeah we heard the announcement i heard the rumors first then heard the announcement making it official and i was like well what we was offering is still actually relevant and still required by small business owners because our focus wasn't on the tax return it was on the benefits of the digital records, knowing your numbers and all things like that. So yeah, yeah we're, we're pushing ahead. And and it was really lovely to see that Zero Hour as well, because we were going to be using Zero Go, obviously, as part of our offerings. So <laughs> it was, um, yeah, no, it's, I am actually a fan of MTD. I think it's a good thing. I know there's many people out there that do not agree with me and don't want it and everything else, but for me, it forces that message of knowing your numbers, having up-to-date numbers, yeah. and then being able to use those numbers to do so many things and improve your business. So, Well, it takes us back yeah. to the conversation we are having earlier on why and how, right? It's MTD is exactly. the how, but if, if you focus on the why, which is it helps small businesses be in better control of their financials and having that financial discipline to then make the right decisions for their business. Well, what's wrong with that, right? And then how do you do that? Well, yes, it happens to be called making tax digital and it comes with certain deadlines and, and what have you not, but those are the mechanics. I think I think maybe the delay will actually help us just focus back on what's important here. Which, and what's important is helping small businesses be successful, period. And digitalization is a big part of that. Yeah, that's part. Yeah. I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> the question though why some people aren't, is it is it scared of change or is it something else? Is it, so. is it sorry Daniel, what uh, you cut out you have to question why some people are don't want it to happen because is it being scared of change and progression or is it um no, it's, uh, look I mean I've I've certainly heard the arguments. Probably the most common argument is just 
any change is cumbersome and you don't want to you don't want to kind of um impose that additional burden on small businesses when they are so fragile right and i i i have sympathy for that i get that right i mean we've thrown quite a bit of change at small businesses over the last three years and obviously they had to navigate well and, and you helped them navigate you know furloughs and 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 COVID and relief schemes and what have you not right so um and there's, there's just a lot to go through but again i think with, when you peel it back to the fundamental which is um by having more regular digital record keeping and you will have better visibility on your numbers you will avoid surprises you'll be in a position to better plan your business and hence grow it there's nothing wrong with that right and one of my one of my favorite quotes and cheryl i apologize in advance if i bore you with it because you probably heard me say it before is um you know, the seven most expensive words in business are we have always done it this way and that applies to large corpus and applies to small businesses right it's it, this this notion of just getting stuck in a particular way and not being willing to challenge yourself and reinvent yourself and innovate um, is very, very, very expensive. And fundamentally it's expensive because if you don't do it, somebody else is. Somebody else is, <laughs> you know, and, and competition is out there and they're out there to eat your lunch, right? So uh, I think it's very important for small businesses to look at digitalization not as a cumbersome um omen but rather as an opportunity to reinvent themselves and hopefully use that to their advantage to grow their business mm. i love that quote I love, well as you know i've used it a few times myself and i think that was the first thing when that first meeting we had when i first met mm. you not long after you joined and i always take that away from me and i've quoted it back to clients and to various different people ever since i think it's just yeah and I always attribute it to you, obviously. <laughs> so. That's very, well, very kind of you. I, I think I read it in some magazine many, many years ago, so I certainly didn't come up with it. But uh, And my teams make fun of me for overusing it, Cheryl. But <laughs> hey, it still gets a message across, though, right? So Which is why I use it every time. Well, it's simple, it it's deliverable, it's, yeah. it's, it's easy to understand, isn't it? There you go. It's always as well. It's like, um, as you said about some business, someone else is going to eat your lunch. It's, it's like... If not, why? Then what? You know, if not now, then when? Yeah. So it's like, um, yeah, it's just important messages, aren't they? They're clear and deliverable. That's right. Um, well, well, I think we'll finish up then with our last, our last question. Okay. I'll, I'll, let, I'll actually, let you pick then, Cheryl. I'll let you pick that. I am. Um, I actually took this as well from um, that zero session that we had when I'm not sure if you was in the room at the time when um, we went around and said what we'd be doing if we wasn't accountants. So I'm going to finish up with that one. So what would you do if you wasn't a zero? Wow. Uh, <laughs> if I wasn't at zero, I'd probably I do some of this anyway, Cheryl, but I'd probably do it full time rather than the way I do it currently, which is more as a as a side op. I'd probably work closely and mentor young entrepreneurs and founders uh, and people starting up their businesses. Um, you know, I do, I do some seed investing in, in various technology companies. Um, and I do it not just because of the investment part of that, but it it helps me stay in touch with the innovation and the technology environment and, and kind of very closely involved with entrepreneurs. And as I said earlier, I, I have the utmost admiration for them. Um, and I'd probably spend more time on that and just, just helping them. Um, and I'd probably continue doing my wine education at the same time. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd double down on that as well, but yeah, it's, uh, some of the things I'm passionate about besides zero. That's what I thought. I thought you'd say something about your wine, to be honest. I was a little bit. Well, <laughs> the only thing is, you know, there's, in the wine trade, there's this saying that says, the best way to make a small fortune in wine is by starting with a very, very, very large function. Um, uh, sorry, very large fortune. And so I guess the message here is it, 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 it's a hard, it's a hard business to, make a fortune in. So as much as I like wine as a hobby, 
I'm not sure it's one I would pursue from an investment perspective. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Can I understand that? Uh, totally. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you and getting to know you even better. And um, My pleasure. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you again soon. I think we're seeing each other next week, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there you go. Excellent. I look forward to it as well, Cheryl. Um, Listen, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, I mean, you know, in particular to you for uh, welcoming me into the arms of the industry as a complete newcomer. Um, it certainly, it certainly has made it easier to, uh, to get to meet such, um, such incredibly welcoming and warm and, and, uh, committed partners. So thank you for that. And Daniel, I really appreciate the chat as well and, uh, look forward to talking again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It's been thank lovely you. meeting you. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. Take care, speak soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like and subscribe and we'd also love to hear your feedback. So please leave us a review or drop us a DM on our Insta at Found a Life Podcast. See you in the next episode. <laughs>